خط تحجیل در فرج آقای امام زمان سلوات أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والحمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا وأعوذ به من شر نفسي إن النفس لأمارة بالسوء إلا ما رحم ربي والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين السلام عليك سيدي ومولاي يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته صلوات بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كان لمؤمن ولا لمؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم For the purification of the souls, the enlightening of the hearts for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior, Ajrallahu Ta'ala Farajahu Sharif, enlighten your souls, purify the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Respected elders, sisters, and brothers, salamun alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. This is an important question that has been posed within the Muslim community and outside as well. It's an area that affects many people, both males and females, and needs to be discussed because it's controversial. And it's also a subject that is important to reflect upon and extrapolate lessons from the 10th of Muharram. Is hijab free choice is a question that arguably has been presented in many different circles around the world today. Whether it's online, whether it's in discussion areas, whether it's in social media, people have come forward and asked the question, a female wearing hijab, does she have a choice in adopting the hijab or not? Meaning, there are those who have come forward today and have proposed this idea that when it comes to hijab, it's free choice. Females are free to choose whether they should adorn the Islamic dress code of modesty and chastity. It's a choice of theirs. And therefore, you'll find, for example, some who have been arguing this for a long period of time. It's a choice for people to make, they say. And that hijab can either be worn by people or not to be worn by individuals. The subject is interesting. Why? 
because today we see a shift in the discussion regarding hijab for about 10 years. Meaning, today when you look at the world, you'll see much more presentation of hijab than there was perhaps over 10 years ago. You see ladies who are wearing hijab, for example, in the world of sports, like Ibtihaj Muhammad, who is the US fencing Olympic champion. Similarly, you'll find more ladies in hijab in the world of politics. You may have come across recently the first lady who is wearing hijab to be voted in the Senate of the Australian, um, uh, Australian Parliament. This particular lady, her name is Fatima Payman. Fatima Payman was what? Was voted in and started being a senator in Australia on the 1st of July. She's the first who wears hijab. She was born in which country? Afghanistan. She is a Hazara, yes? Yet she came to Australia. Later, she went into politics, part of the Labour Party, and won and was, is the first hijabi to be elected in Australia in such a particular position. You find, for example, hijabis in advertisements. You see them working in many different stores and places. The presentation of hijab now is completely different to how it was 10, 15 years ago. There is much more visible uh, presence of people, ladies who wear hijab, than there was back in the time. And that's why today there is much more discussion of hijab in the news. Sometimes it's related to the niqab, the burqa, because Belgium recently last year banned it. They said it's not allowed to be worn in that country. Ten years after France banned it. Similarly, Denmark are following as well. They're saying that this can't be worn at the same time. You find together with this, recently there was a major controversy in India. What happened in India was that ladies wearing hijab were not allowed to enter or to go to university, to colleges, to study in some provinces in India because it was said that anyone wearing any religious symbol cannot be allowed to enter. There was a lot of demonstrations and much, you know, people came forward and were unhappy with this. At the same time, you ask many of the ladies, they'll tell you there's been an increase in what's known today as hijabophobia. What is this? This is the expression that people have when it comes to feeling discrimination because of the hijab. So many of our ladies and many of our sisters, may Allah bless them, when they wear the hijab, they complain that sometimes we get abuse. Sometimes there is discrimination. Sometimes there is harassment. In fact, in a Pew study, Muslims here in this country, in the United States, were asked about harassment, about discrimination particularly. 63% of Muslim women said they had faced some form of discrimination in their life. Over 30% of men said they had faced discrimination. Clearly, it is suggested that hijabophobia is part of Islamophobia. And therefore, there are those who have come forward and said, you know, when it comes to the presentation of hijab, it is also a matter which is challenging some of our community in different parts of the Western world. At the same time, you couple this with a rise of what's known as hijabi influences on social media. These particular individuals, many of them were wearing hijab one day and they seem to take it off the next day after gaining many followers. Isn't it? Some of them would gather millions of followers on Instagram, for example, on TikTok. Then they decide one day, I am not no longer a hijabi. They remove their hijab and they give their own reasons for it. They have influenced many people. Then you have those who are performing what's known as hijab tutorials, makeup tutorials, and so on and so forth. Therefore, the discussion uh, regarding hijab and a lecture that examines hijab today may be different to about 15 years ago because the challenges we're facing today are arguably slightly different. That is why it's of the utmost importance that this is discussed because today there is also what's known as the modest fashion industry. What is this? It is estimated that this is worth around the world $283 billion. And according to Forbes magazine, Muslim women 
who are involved in this modest fashion industry are those who are valued as 44 billion dollars this is not a small industry now, many people today are able to access for example different forms of hijab and buy it online then before then many years ago it's a subject that requires discussion why because this question is hijab free choice is one that is being asked at schools colleges and universities at the workplace the very definition of hijab is being challenged today the very presence of social media and the interaction between males and females is redefining what hijab is and how it should be looked at therefore there is a need to answer a number of key questions controversially regarding hijab number one there is a ted talk that has been viewed by more than eight million people or eight million times it says that hijab is not wajib how do we respond to this ted talk number two of great importance in this particular regard and that is when it comes to challenges today for hijab for muslim ladies wearing hijab what are they how do we face these challenges number three is hijab free choice meaning does islam advocate this is it that a female muslim has a choice to wear hijab or is it not number four many parents struggle when it comes to their daughters when they come to the age of puberty how do they present hijab to them what are the recommendations the tips the tools that we should offer for our parents both males and females fathers and mothers to help ensure that the hijab is worn and number five very importantly was the hijab of the ladies of ahl al-bayt taken away from them in karbala because many a times you hear these narrations that the hijab was removed was it removed according to narrations and how do we understand it and finally what are the great lessons that can be presented with regards to hijab from ashura from the movement of sayyid al-shuhada but specifically from looking at the great lady of patience sayyid zainab salawatullahi wa salamu alayha When it comes to the world of YouTube, there are many who have come forward and have had sensational titles in order to in include or to attract people, clickbait as it's called. If you go on TED, this popular platform, there is a 17-minute presentation by a particular individual that I do not wish to name. This title of this video is, Is Hijab Wajib in Islam? And it's been viewed more than 8 million times. 8 million is not a small number. This particular lady who herself is not a hijabi comes forward and presents an argument whereby she says Islam does not make hijab wajib. Why? She says if you look at the Quran, the verse that talks about hijab in, is in the Quran and uses the word hijab has nothing to do with hijab. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when you come to address them, place a hijab between you and them. And the hijab here means a curtain when you came, when you come to speak to the wives of the Holy Prophet. She similarly argues that hijab was specific for that time to distinguish between free women and slave women. And so she says, because that distinguishing element doesn't exist today, we don't have free women and slave women. Therefore, hijab is not wajib. Very briefly, how do we respond to this particular individual? Number one, today we have experts in every field. We have people who come forward and have qualifications, who are qualified to speak on behalf of a particular school of thought, for example, because they are learned. Why is it that today anybody can come and speak on behalf of Islam? Meaning that why is it someone would come and say today, I am able to say that this is not wajib, this is wajib. And they're not an expert. They're not necessarily qualified. It's not their remit. It's outside their qualification. This particular individual claims to know about Islamic teachings, yet she makes a number of mistakes. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. A second salawat. Allah. 
الثات صلوات I don't mind children playing but it distracts the brothers and sisters so it's not respectful for children to be running around in the majlis of Sayyid al-Shuhada they can sit they can take part no problem but in running around me I have seen people watching them and they'll be very dizzy by the end of the majlis therefore it is best if they sit Jazakumullah khair sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad This lady has this claim. How do we respond to her? Number one, she's not an expert. She can't be speaking on behalf of over 1.6 billion Muslims when she has no qualification to do so. Number two, when it comes to this claim, she makes a number of errors and inaccurate statements. She says at the time of the Prophet, Muslim scholars gathered and decided that hijab is wajib. There were no Muslim scholars who sat at the time of the Prophet to decide hijab. It was the Prophet of Islam. There's no such thing as scholars would gather and decide when the Prophet was alive, isn't it? Similarly, what does she say? She says that the idea of this particular verses in the Quran can be, mis it can be interpreted to mean something else. She completely doesn't refer to hadith and this is a major problem. If today people come and take Quran by itself, they can interpret it the way they like. There are terrorists who have come and have imposed their understanding on Quranic verses. We can't just look at the Quran and do not necessarily solicit the help of a hadith. Because the Prophet of Islam would say they go hand in hand. The hadith of the Ahl al-Bayt are on par with the Quran. She says that hijab has been made wajib because at that time, the free women were being targeted because the slaves were easy target. Slaves often at that time were being abused. So she said the free women were asked to wear the hijab because it was the custom of that time so that they are differentiated and they are not abused. So she says every culture has a dress. And at that time, that was the dress to protect the lady from being abused. We ask her, we say, she says, in this day and age, in the Western world, there is no custom dress. It's a normal dress. We say today, when people wear normal dresses in the Western world, they're not attacked. In other words, there is a very likelihood of anybody out there being somehow, what? Being somehow attacked in any shape or form. Therefore, her deduction is not academic, is not something that even is worth replying to. Unfortunately, though, it has attracted so many people. Millions have come and have observed it. Yet, how do we respond in this regard? Is Hijab wajib in Islam? It's an important question. There are three ayat that we briefly look at because it's an examination that many of you have probably already heard. But just to refresh our understanding that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has come forward categorically in the Muslim world today, there is an agreement and there is an ijma, a near consensus that hijab is as wajib as salah. Hijab is as wajib as fasting in Ramadan. Hijab is as wajib as Hajj. Therefore, when some people come forward and say, I personally don't agree with hijab. I don't want to wear hijab. It's the same as someone saying, I don't want to pray. It's the same as someone saying, I don't want to go to Hajj. I don't believe it's wajib. There isn't a disagreement with regards to the obligation of hijab, but unfortunately, through influences, people begin to think that hijab is a, a possible gateway or way in which they can somehow be let off from it. When you come to the Quran, there are three ayat, very briefly, that we have to look at. Chapter 24 has two of these ayat. Chapter 24, verse number 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about what's known as the khimar. There are two words that you have to understand. The Quran, when it comes to hijab, does not use the word hijab because hijab is a term later used. Quran uses khimar and jilbab. What's khimar? Khimar is something that's worn over the head, but also it is it covers the neck and the chest as well because at the time of the prophet of islam women used to cover their hair but only their hair you know the ladies know this term there is a hijab today known as the bandana hijab you know this hijab god help me if you don't yes 
You don't, should know there are people who wear the bandana hijab, which means they just cover their hair only and their neck is showing completely, yes. This is the hijab people used to wear before Islam. Even the non-Muslims used to cover their hair. Quran comes forward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, no, this is not enough. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلِيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُورِهِنَّ عَلَىٰ جِيُوبِهِنْ Allah says, you must place this khimar in Arabic khimar. There is no disagreement about this. Khimar is what? Is something that covers the hair completely and what? And the neck as well as the bosom, as well as the chest. It covers it completely. That's one ayah. There is no disagreement about this. Another ayah is what? Is in Surah Al-Ahzab, verse number 59. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhan nabi, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'i al-mu'mineen, an yudneena alayhin min jalabi bihin. O Prophet, say to your wives, to your daughters, and to the women of the believers, they must wear the jilbab, yes, by placing it on the body. Because what happens, this jilbab is what? It's a loose article of clothing that covers the entire body. This jilbab should be placed, yudnina means made sure that it's not sitting tight, but one that is what easily flowing. That is something that covers the entire body. Similarly, in Surah An Nur, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes forward and says, Wala yadribna bi arjulihinna liya'lam ma yukhfina min zinatahun. Allah says part of hijab is that they should not strike their feet in a manner that draws attention of men towards them. Therefore, the conclusion here is what? The conclusion is that the hijab must cover what? The hair must cover the neck. It must cover the entire body. And it should not be deliberately attractive. Because this is all from the Quran. Yes? Question. Are females allowed to wear colorful hijab? This is an important question. Ladies say, okay. If this is the case, are we allowed to, for example, wear a red scarf or a green scarf or a different colorful scarf? The answer is, if the female is not seeking to draw attention, so her niya is not to attract others, there is no problem. As long as the hijab fits this particular criteria of it covering the entire body, including the neck including the hair and the body is what is covered in a loose fashion the face can be exposed the hands can be exposed up to the wrist and as long as that is fulfilled there are different types of hijabs out there the question today is what are the challenges that this particular presentation of hijab is facing in the world today amongst our communities there are those who have come forward and said one of those challenges that we face in this regard is the fact that many are coming forward especially the youngsters are uh, saying that we are being forced to wear it in other words there is this compulsion there is this threat there is this unfortunate mentality that they do not understand why they're wearing it and we'll come to this later when we discuss the parent-child relationship. Similarly, others have come forward and said, today there is a war against hijab. There is a negative depiction of hijab in the media, for instance. When was the last time you saw a wonderful positive story about a hijabi, for instance? You will not see much of that. However, people come forward and say that this particular demonstration highlights there is lots of negativity that exists in the media, for instance, about hijabis and those who wear the Islamic dress code. Of course, the third area that we are also facing a challenge, and this requires your attention, because often our brothers switch off in the discussion regarding hijab, and that is the discussion relating to social hijab, isn't it? Because today, when we speak about hijab, many shift towards the physical hijab. But also the social hijab is of the utmost importance, meaning that our brothers have a pivotal role in both areas. They have a very important role to play in encouraging the adornment of physical hijab, whether they are fathers or husbands or brothers. But also the way that they interact with the opposite gender sometimes leaves a lot to be desired. In other words, number one, the interactions on social media. Some of the brothers, they like pictures of the ladies. And therefore, these particular pictures on social media are not necessarily the best pictures. But when a brother likes them, what are they sending a message? They're saying, brilliant, it's very good. 
It's good for you to have this. And so some of the ladies, what do they do? They keep having these images because sometimes they crave the attention, perhaps, perhaps. Or sometimes they are oblivious of what that they are doing, isn't it? Social hijab is not necessarily a, a discussion that has to be ignored. It's a very important part of the discussion regarding hijab. The other area that I would like to draw your attention when it comes to discussing this subject is the redefinition of hijab. And that is what? Please pay attention to this because it's very important. Today, we have the infusion of Western liberal ideas and feminist concepts when it comes to hijab. There is arguably an attempt to redefine what hijab is. Someone asks, what do you mean? I don't understand that. There are people today who come out and say hijab is empowering for me. Hijab gives me the strength, for example. Hijab is my weapon, for example, which is great. It sounds amazing. These words empowering, for example, these are my powerful dress, for instance. But today you do not hear many coming forward and saying in the Western world to the non-Muslims, Hijab is what God wanted me to wear, therefore I wear it. Because there is an attempt to redefine what this dress code is all about. Let me explain a little bit further. Muslim community, some of them are desperate to be included in the Western world. There is a desperation to be what? To be somehow accepted part of society. As a result, Hijab and the values of hijab are slowly being taken away from religion and being given a new kind of coating, a new kind of presentation. What do we mean? Today, there are those who will tell you that hijab is a choice. You are free. You can either wear the hijab or don't. And this, when I was discussing with a number of ladies, sometimes in Q&As, or around social media, perhaps today if we were to ask people, is hijab free choice? There were many who will say, yes, it is free choice. It's up to me whether to wear hijab or not. Right? And this is a question that if you were to ask, for example, the elder of the community, they would say, no, it's not a free choice. You have to do it. It's not a choice that you have to wear the hijab, isn't it? What has happened today? What has happened today is the whole concept is now being pushed towards a very dangerous slope. Please focus on this. I know some of you may not agree, but just bear with me as I present what has been arguably a major challenging issue in our times. And that is the hijab is now all about beauty and sexualization. Today, there are those who wear the hijab but I've forgotten completely what the philosophy and the ethos of hijab is. Hence, you find them coming out on catwalks, going on the front page of fashion magazines, and even certain magazines that are misogynistic and what are disgraceful to even mention their names on the member. Oh, but I'm the first hijabi to go on this magazine. It's an amazing achievement for me. What has happened, therefore, is that there is a push to fulfill the Western liberal as well as the feminist agenda on hijab. I, they say, as a believer, as a mu'mina, as an individual who adorns this dress code that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants me to, now I am wearing it in a way that the Western world should approve. I need to present it in a way so that I can be included. Otherwise, it's not going to fulfill its objective. This is a term that today some people who have discussed this are presenting. It's called cognitive dissidence. Cognitive dissidence means what? It means when an individual is at war inside with conflicting ideas. For example, Someone says, I'm a Muslim, but being gay is okay. There's double standards. In their minds, they're, they're going through a, a, a conflict internally. Someone comes and says, I'm a Muslim, but wearing hijab is not wajib. This is coming from where? 
There is a redefinition attempt of Islamic dress code, or there is a redefinition attempt of some of the Islamic values that we need to understand. So the question is, is hijab free choice? No. You ask me how? Surely people have a choice to wear it or not. Of course, as a free will, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you a choice whether to pray, whether to come to majlis, whether to pay your khums and zakat. That's a choice as far as free will. But when it comes to you as an individual who is a Muslim who has submitted to the will and the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do you have a choice in this particular regard? In other words, this choice means what? It means there's option A and option B. And one day I choose option A, another I choose option B. Allah Taala in Surah Al Ahzab has demonstrated this beautifully. وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ Remember this verse, chapter thirty-three, verse thirty-nine. Allah says, when Allah and His Messenger have said something is wajib, you do not have a choice. When he has said something is wajib, do you have a choice? No. Do I, as an individual who is a Muslim, who has accepted the religion of Islam, who understands the religion of Islam, can I come and redefine it according to my worldview? According to how I understand Islam? Oh, but brother, please, you're a male. You don't understand how hard it is. It's very difficult. You spoke about hijabophobia. Do you know, I always say, may Allah bless the ladies who adorn this hijab of Fatima, adorn the hijab of Zainab. They are in a truly special position. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants the identity of Islam to be through them. Today, if we walk as men yes, on the streets, they may not know we are Muslim. But when a lady who is wearing hijab walks on the street with pride and honor wearing this dress code, she's identified as a believer. And this is a source of blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rabbil Alameen wanted this, isn't it? Now the question here, very importantly, and that is what? And that is the religion of Islam is founded on the concept of submission. This is empowerment. Taslim. I, as a believer, believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is my Lord, don't I? I believe the Prophet is my Prophet, don't I? I believe about the Quran. I believe about the Ahl al-Bayt. Now all this... Belief is important, right? When I come, when it comes to the laws of Islam, if I believe in all this, do I have the right to reinterpret the laws myself and make my own deductions about the law? Or do I submit to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said through the Prophet and the Ahl al-Bayt? It's as simple as that. For me as a believer, a Muslim is someone who submits. A Muslim is somebody who recognizes that Taslim is a cornerstone when it comes to a fundamental aspect of our faith. And that's why it's an important discussion that we need to have. Yes, because today we see there are ladies unfortunately taking their hijab off, influenced by people around them, influenced for example on social media. They should not ever be somehow pushed away. They should never be judged as well, judged in the sense of what? That you are condemned and you are this and the comments some people make. This is wrong too. Yes. Because sometimes some of these ladies may have heard something and there's always a reason. There's always a reason why some people take off their hijab. Sometimes, by the way, it's a request of their husbands. Sometimes some of them who are not married, they said, we want to get married. And some of the boys out there are looking for non-hijabis, for example. Sometimes it's pressure to do with work. All these reasons are not necessarily acceptable in Islam, without a shadow of a doubt. They're not Islamically approved as a reason to take off your hijab. But at the same time, what needs to happen is there needs to be a concerted effort to sit down and discuss what are these reasons why some are taking their hijab? If they think it's free choice, we need to bring them back on the table and have this discussion. As believers, there is what? There is a set of instructions within the religion of Islam. I can't, as a Muslim, redefine Islam. Please be aware of this danger out there. Because there are those today who are telling you, what's wrong? 
with being a Muslim and part of LGBTQ? What's wrong of being a Muslim and, for example, allowing females to lead the salah of males? What's wrong of being a Muslim, for example, and being associated with certain movements? As a believer, you subscribe to a particular code of practice. This code of practice is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as a constitution for the well-being in this world and akhirah. It's for our best. Yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed it due to wisdom, due to much blessings for you and I. Therefore, there is an important area in this regard, and that is parents struggle. They say very well, I am convinced that hijab is not a free choice. Free choice meaning what? Just like I have to pray, I have to wear the hijab. Just like I have to do my wajibat, I wear the hijab. But my nine-year-old daughter is not. How can I present hijab to my young daughter when it comes to this Islamic obligation? There are a number of tips that have been presented, yes, so that we can, inshallah ta'ala, help each other. Number one, the discussion about hijab should not start when the girl is nine. Start from a younger age. In other words, be encouraging, be supportive, be an individual who is a good role model in this regard. But start when the daughter or the young girl is younger than nine. You ease hijab. You ease her into this slowly, isn't it? That's what, that's number one. Number two, it's very important that we understand that those who object hijab later at school, college, university, do so for a number of reasons. One of them is perhaps their aqidah and iman is not as strong as it should be. So what do we need to do? We need to infuse the love of God into our children from a young age. In which way? We speak to our youngsters and say, look at the beauties of this world. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given. Isn't it just a matter of expressing gratitude and thankfulness that we do what Allah is pleased with? So when a child recognizes that Allah is wise, that Allah loves them, that Allah wants the best for them, and as a result, therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to do one, two, three, four. Pray, adorn the hijab, for example. Don't lie, don't cheat, etc., etc. It's not made obligatory because you just have to do it. But rather we present it from the notion that Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wants the best for them and therefore increase their aqeedah but also their connection with their creator. Similarly, we must do the tarbiyah of taslim. Please, my sisters and brothers, there is a problem amongst some of our community members around the world today and they are struggling with this taslim. They are struggling with this submission. They say, if I can't figure it out in my mind, I don't do it. Convince me, brother. Convince me why I should pay homes 20%. Convince me, for example, regarding some of the laws in Islam. Why? If I am not given the correct answers, I am not going to necessarily practice. From a young age, we need to harbor and inculcate within our children the concept that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the sublime, perfect being wants the best for us and therefore we may not understand some of these rulings but we must do it why because it's for our own benefit if i do not inculcate this into the mind of my daughter from a young age what happens is she'll hear voices she'll hear sounds and clips and others saying oh it's okay we later wear the hijab when you're 50 when you're 60 you don't need to wear it now there are difference of opinion there is no such thing about hijab in islam and she'll start believing it she'll watch this ted talk which has 8 million views of course 8 million views surely they can't all be wrong and therefore slowly begins to be convinced to take off the hijab if it is not based on strong foundations the foundations of aqeedah and understanding why hijab is important so the young girl asks why should i wear hijab allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says adna an yu'rafna fala yu'dhain. it's there so that they are identified and they're not harmed rabbil alameen allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants protection yes you might say to me today there might be some ladies who wear hijab who might be attacked but this could happen to anyone 
out there. Yes. This could happen to any lady in the Western society. People are attacked. And women generally are quite vulnerable. Therefore, the recognition is I need to understand the ethos and teach it to my children. Similarly, I should not ignore their questions from a young age. I should not be dismissive. If they have concerns about hijab, I should not necessarily say, don't ask these questions, just wear it. And also, there is a movement out there that's saying it's culture. What do you mean? There are people out there that are saying hijab is not Islam, it's not wajib. It's part of culture. It's what culture has introduced. Culture defines certain types of hijab, but hijab in its essence is part of Islamic teachings. As we said, there is a definition for it. Similarly, what do we have to do? We have to explain to them this very interesting parable. When it comes to school uniform, do people have a choice to wear school uniform or not? When kids go to school, are they given the choice to wear school uniform or do they have to wear it? Of course they have to wear it. Usually, schools don't give children a choice on the uniform. When there is a, a training or people are part of the army, do they have a choice to wear the army uniform or not? Of course they're not given a choice. It's part of the uniform of that establishment. Therefore, hijab is part of the identity of a Muslim woman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants it to be such. I ask you, some say, you, are, you tell me hijab is not free choice. But how can I say this to my young kid, child? This is how you say it. Do parents ask their children whether they want to go to school or not? Tell me. Do they? They don't. Parents take their school to children whether their children like it or not, isn't it? Why is it when it comes to faith and religion, akhirah? All of a sudden, now there is a discussion about choice. All of a sudden, oh, but you know what? Maybe they don't want to. It's okay. Let's not necessarily ask them to do it and so on and so forth. Of course, there is a difference between compulsion. Compulsion and when it comes to forcing an individual should be avoided. It's not something that we encourage. But we don't need to get to that stage. We need to build an individual with their iman and understanding and faith so that they're aware as to why they need to wear it. Similarly, maybe Make it a form of happy practice. Meaning what? Congratulate them. Support them, both men and women. When it comes to the time of their bulugh, for example, do a celebration. Ulama say that this is not taklif, this is tashrif. This is honoring. Yes? They are now being honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this particular regard. At the same time, be very wary of the influences of friends, of social media and others. And don't necessarily panic if they have a doubt or decide to take the hijab off. What do we mean? Today, there is a soft war against hijab. What is that? Very subliminal, subtle messages that you see and you find in the Western world that gives you the projection that a hijabi is an oppressed individual. You type hijab on Google, what do you get? You get pictures of people that somehow insinuate that they are being subjugated, that they are oppressed. I remember there was a king many years ago. He loved clothes. He was somebody who was fond of his clothes. What happened? He said, whoever designs the best clothes for me i will gift him yes some huge amount of gold so three individuals were very smart they came to him they said to him your majesty we have a special cloth that no one has ever seen before and we'd like to design it for you he said very well they said this cloth that you're going to wear is invisible only those who are clever will see it if you're not smart, you can't see it. He was embarrassed to say, I want to see it, because if he doesn't see it, he's not smart. He said, very well, go and do it. They didn't do anything, of course. They came, they said to him, you need to wear this. And it was nothing, right? So he takes his outer garments, and they put it on him. They say, amazing, it looks amazing. He's like, yes, yes, yes. They said, remember, anyone who comes and tells you 
that you're not wearing any outer garments is not smart because only smart people can see it. And it's spread in the community that only the smart can see it. Therefore, everyone was silent because no one wants to say I'm not smart. Everyone was saying, MashaAllah, it looks amazing on you. It's so beautiful. So when a king came out with his, you know, only underwear, he came out and uh, he sat. Everyone was quiet. Only a child looked at his father and says, why isn't the king wearing any clothes? What's wrong with the king? The father says, shush, you're not one of the intelligent ones. That's why you can't see it. Yes, there is this soft subliminal message that makes everyone believe. Yes, yes, hijab is free choice. Yes, yes, you can redefine it. Let's make it something that attracts people. Let's make it something that defines Western feminist values until everyone starts to accept. Yes, that's what it is. That's how it should be. Otherwise, people will be angry in the Western world. How can we? They won't accept the hijab. We need to make them to accept it. Yes. This soft war is very delicate. And that's why it requires discussions. It requires us to work together to give support to each other to ensure that and to inculcate the Islamic value of hijab. When it comes to Karbala, there are those who ask this question. And that is what? And that is, we hear sometimes from the member that the hijab of the Ahl al-Bayt, the ladies of the Ahl al-Bayt, was removed from them on Sham Gharibah. Sometimes this is presented in different majalis and masaib. Is this the case or not? It's an interesting historical discussion that requires a lengthy analysis. But in brief, the narrations that we have talk about the hijab of the Ahl al-Bayt that was taken being the outer abba because they had outer garments and not necessarily their covering of the hair for the majority of them meaning what meaning that the enemies the army of Yazid when they attacked that night when they attacked after the martyrdom of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam what did they seek they see they were seeking to loot and to take away whatever possessions they wanted isn't it and so for certain individuals, what they did was, for example, for the, one of the daughters of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Sukaina, who is 13 or 14, they would rip her earrings. And that would mean that they would take away the outer garment that she was wearing and rip the, the earrings from her ears. We do not necessarily, many of our historians and ulama are not in agreement that the hair of these honorable ladies were exposed. Perhaps some of the children it was exposed. Because later they say the evidence is in the courtyard of Yazid, Sayyida Zainab would say to Yazid, she'd say, is it fair that your women are covered by their faces and the women of Ahl al-Bayt are not? Meaning what? Meaning that the army, when they attacked the women, what did they do? They took their outer, for example, the abas that they had, right? The face covering that they had, they ripped them. But not necessarily the hijab. And Allah knows best. This is not necessarily saying that they did not snatch the hijab completely away from the Ahl al-Bayt. But it's very unlikely. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted and wants the, uh, the women of the Ahl al-Bayt not to be exposed in such a manner. To have, for example, God forbid, Sayyida Zainab and other honorable ladies, their complete hijab being removed from them uh, is something that some of the scholars find difficult to accept. And there isn't necessarily any clear evidence that that actually took place. This is not exonerating the army of Yazid, who perpetrated heinous crimes on the day of Ashura and on that night. However, at the same time, it's likely what they did was that they took away whatever it was that was outer garments of the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam Despite this, you'll find that the Ahl al-Bayt alayhum salam would ensure that the principle of hijab on the day of Ashura was upheld was something that was demonstrated and Sayyida Zainab, this great lady, together with other ladies of the Ahl al-Bayt, would have a plan to ensure that those individuals would indeed be the representation of hijab. They would do everything it takes on the day of Ashura, before Ashura, after Ashura, on their journey towards 
Kufa and then from Kufa to Sham, the hijab was center stage. And therefore, one of the great things that we can inspire our youngsters today is to take Sayyidatun Nisa Fatima as Zahra salawatullahi wa salamu alayha. as well as Sayyida Zainab, peace and blessings be upon her, these honorable ladies are the role models. If someone today says, I don't want to wear hijab, you ask them, is this something that pleases the lady of light Fatima and Sayyida Zainab? That we attend majalis with great honor and pride. We cry, we beat our chests. We are Husseini, we are Abbasi, we are Zainabi. But do we do that which pleases them? or that which places anguish in their hearts. Can anyone today say that those who take their hijab and deliberately refuse to wear it are placing happiness in the heart of Sayyida Fatima and Sayyida Zainab? There is a great opportunity for them. There is a wonderful chance to return back and to adorn this important dress code. But therefore, you find that these people are great exemplars. These people are the role models, these holy individuals who stood to embody the values of modesty, of chastity in their lives. And therefore, as followers, we look up to them. We look up to them, each and every one of them, those who represented each and every single group on the day of Ashura. There are these brave ladies who continued the mission of Imam al Hussein with dignity and honor. And there are those who, on the day of Ashura, gave their lives and they were in their youthful age. And amongst those is Ali al Akbar. This great individual truly was special to the heart of Imam al Hussein, alayhi salam, as well as the Ahl al Bayt. Because imagine how much love they had for the Prophet of Islam. Imagine how much people wanted to see the Prophet of Islam. But when it came to Ali al Akbar, it would break the heart of Hussein because he would remind him of Rasulullah. Imagine those moments, the Wida, he's the first from Bani Hashim to emerge on the day of Ashura. Earlier on, some narrations say he is the one who recited the Adhan and reminded people of the Adhan of Rasulullah. But that moment where he stood before Aba Abdullah al Hussein was a moment of anger wish and pain for Sayyid al-Shuhada because he is about to bid farewell to his beloved son. He looks at Ali al-Akbar. He can't tell him go back. He can't refuse his request. He asks him for one thing. Do you know what Imam al Hussein asks Ali al-Akbar? He says to him, Bunay Ali, ilayya ilay, ashummuka wa tashummuni. Oh my son Ali, all I want from you is one thing. Come towards me. Let me hug you. Let me bid farewell to you. Let me kiss you. This was the emotional farewell, the wada' between the father and the son. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam drops to the ground. He starts to shed the tears. He is crying. He looks up to the heavens. He starts reciting writing this famous dua he says allahumma ashhad ala haula al qaum faqad baraza ilayhim ghulam ashbahu an nas bi rasulika sallallahu alayhi wa alihi khalqan wa khuluqan wa mantiqa ya allah this man that is about to go to the battlefield reminds us of the Prophet in his appearance, in his akhlaq, in the way that he conducts himself. And every time we wish to look at the Prophet, we looked at him. Ali al Akbar bids farewell to his father. He goes towards the battlefield. He recites these famous lines Ana Ali ibn al Hussein, Ibn Ali, a late and la and honey, a dribukum bis safe, hatta yan honey, dharba gulam in Hashemi and Alawi. I am Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali. I will never break down but i will make sure that my sword breaks you all down the strike of a of a youth who is hashimi who is alawi 
Ali and Al-Akbar begins to fight. Uh, Imam Al-Hussein is looking at him. There are some narrations that say his mother Layla was there in Karbala. She was uh, anxiously waiting for the news of her son Akbar. But she couldn't see him. She couldn't see where he was on the plains. She would look at Imam Al-Hussein's facial uh, expressions. And at that moment, Imam Al-Hussein's uh, face changed. Uh, she looked at him and said, Sayyidi Aba Abdullah, has anything bad happened to my son Akbar? He said, there is a man who is fighting him. I'm worried that this man might hurt him. Oh, Layla, if you want to see your son again, ask Allah and pray to Allah because the dua of the mother is answered by Allah. Imagine that Layla hears these beautiful words of Imam al Hussein, the mother's out there today the dua is special isn't it that the narration says Layla enters the tent takes off her hijab sits on her prayer mat raises her hands cries Ilahi bi ghurbati Aba Abdullah oh Allah Aba Abdullah is alone on the plains of Karbala Ilahi ya Raj Yusuf li Yaqub lurd ilayya walad Ali. Oh Allah, you're the one who returned Yusuf to Yaqub. I beg you, I ask you, I want to see my son Ali one more time, one more time. This is the dua of the mother. Ali al Akbar kills that man. Now he returns back to the tents. He looks at his father. He says, Father, Father, I'm thirsty. Is there any water? I need to gain strength to fight the enemy. Enemy. Allahu Akbar. Look at Aba Abdullah al Hussein's heart. He was torn into pieces. How can a father look at the son and not be able to provide them water? Imam says to him, Bunay Ali, your grandfather Rasulullah will quench your thirst on the day of Qiyamah. He will quench your thirst soon too. But go to your mother. Go to your mother Layla. She's waiting for you. She wants to see you for the final time uh, Ali and Al-Akbar goes towards the tent uh, he enters the tent he finds his mother unconscious uh, Layla cried and cried and cried uh, then she was in that state so he enters subhanallah the riwayah says he sits uh, when he sits he looks at Layla and the eyes begin to tear up the tears fall on the cheek of his mother uh, she went wakes up she sees Ali and Al-Akbar this is her son he has returned is this a dream has my son come back in real life Bunay Ali are you here she then says to him my son Ali I want you to stand up before me I ask you a mother what does she ask her son in the final moments of his life what does she want from Ali and Al-Akbar Layla I wanted only one thing she says to her son Ali please just stand in front of me that's it just stand just stand Allahu Akbar why why Layla why you want Ali to stand in front of you is it because you'll see the body of Ali torn into pieces Allah because she wanted to see the body of Ali and Al-Akbar in one piece for the final time it was the final with uh, after leaving the tent uh, fully submissive to the commands of Allah Ali and Al-Akbar marches towards the battlefield uh, still weakened but brave and courageous uh, when he is fighting the enemy a man comes from behind uh, says I will make his father mourn for him uh, whilst Ali and Al-Akbar is fighting uh, he strikes Ali on his head Ali and Al-Akbar falls onto the horse the blood from his head covers the face of the horse the horse starts to run towards the campsite of Yazid they all surround Ali and Al-Akbar a man stabs him with a dagger a third man hits him with a stone a 
another man strikes him with a sword until Ali and Al Akbar falls onto the ground. He calls عليك من السلام أبتا يا أبا عبد الله الله أكبر May Allah never show a father a day in which they have to see and hear the cries of their sons May Allah never show a mother a day where she has to see the body of her son Ali al Akbar is in the battlefield Imam al Hussein now goes towards the battlefield the poet says it's as if he left on the wrong direction his daughter Sukain I said, Father, why are you going this way? He says to her, My daughter, don't blame me. You don't know how it is to lose a son. I'm going towards Ali and Al Akbar. The poet is as if Imam Al Hussein said, On his way to Ali, he looks at Najaf. He said, Father, Ya Amir Al Mu'mineen, you lifted the gates of Khaybar, but you never had to lift the body of your son. He comes next to Ali in Al Akbar. He sits next to Ali in Al Akbar. He cries, Bunay Ali ala dunya ba'daka al afa. Oh my son Ali, what is the value of this world after you? You call me and I have to respond, but I can't save your life. I can't save your life. Oh my son Ali, how how can you leave your father and go? The riwayah says, Ali al Akbar, last moment of his life. Uh, he was breathing his last moments. Uh, he looked towards his right. Uh, he was seen smiling. Then he somehow turned his bruised head towards the left. Uh, and then he was seen in a state of distress. Uh, he was seen unhappy. Imam al Hussein wonders, uh, Oh, my son Ali, why do you look right and left? What's happened? Uh, in his final words to his father these are the final things he said to his father he said father father on my right is Rasulullah he is quenching my thirst from the pond of Kothar but on my left is my grandmother Fatima she is slapping her cheeks she is striking her cheeks she cries Oh my son Hussein, Mavlum Hussein. The poet says it's as if Imam Al Hussein would cry that moment and say, Oh my son Akbar, please tell my mother, please don't slap your cheeks. My mother, don't slap your cheeks. ألا لعنة الله على القوم الظالمين وسيعلم الذين ظلموا أي منقلب ينقلبون نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العز الأجل الأكرم إلهي بفاطمة وأبيها وبعلها وبنيها والسر المستودع فيها يا الله 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 يا رحمن يا رحيم يا مقلب القلوب ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا رب العالمين on this night as we remember Ali and Al-Akbar and Shuhada Karbala we beseech you and we pray to you to help all our sisters and those who are in difficult situation to help the brothers support them when it comes to the decision of hijab يا رب العالمين Ya Allah, we ask you to bestow upon us your rahmah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you to grant shifa to all those who are sick and are injured, especially our brothers and sisters in Afghanistan, in Kabul, after the terrorist explosion yesterday, which caused many tens of them to be injured and many to be martyred. Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask you and beseech you بحق مريض كربلاء زين العابدين to bestow upon them شفاء يا الله 
Ya Allah, accept our a'mal, forgive our sins, hasten the reappearance of the 12th Imam, and make us of his devout and sincere followers. We send the thawab of the recitation of Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha to the souls of all your marhumin and also the souls of the maraja, the shuhada, those who served Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Surah Al-Mubarakat Al-Fatiha, but before it's salawat.